Father, we thank you for Andrew. We just pray that truly as he speaks what you've laid on his heart, that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst. Amen. Bless him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. Can we give Johnny a hand? He always asks everybody else to give a hand. Johnny is a little dynamite. He's awesome. Anyway, good morning, church. Everybody well? Anybody excited for the word this morning? I'm excited for the word, and I already know what I'm going to be talking about. So we're going to have a good time together. Let's just pray together. Just repeat after me. Holy Ghost, I open my heart for your spoken word. And I give you permission to mess me right up. Amen. Amen. You've been in a series as a church this year called Telios, talking about maturity. And I want to pick up on that. And I got a couple of things I want to share this morning that will hopefully help some of you who've maybe not locked in as tight as you maybe thought you would on areas of maturity this year. As a church, words that have come, we are 50, uh, no we're not, we are 46 weeks into the year. Is that right? We've got six left before the end of the year. So it's a great time to catch up if you've missed anything. And if you've been running like a, street, like a steam train all the way through, you've still got six more weeks of teleos, maturity, where God wants to do things in you. So I want to share this morning some practical things. I got two texts, I'll take you to one and talk about seed in a moment, and then I got my main text which I'll take you to, but it's going to be very practical this morning to help us embrace and keep before our hearts and keep before our minds what it is God is after from us as a church and for you as an individual, for you as a family, for you as a business. What has the, the teleos, the maturity, meant and what has it been this year? So the first scripture I want to take you to, and we don't only go into two, I'll quote others, but we go into two, is Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, I'm reading from the NIV. If you could go there on your device or in your Bible, and if you get there fast and you want to know what the next one is, in a few moments we're going to Genesis 30. But Luke chapter 8, and I, I want to spend about 10 minutes on this before we get into the main essence of the word, because this is really, really important. And it's the parable of the sower, which I've heard mentioned here a couple of times in the length of time I've been here. But I want to read it to you, and I want to draw your attention to the condition of heart and the condition of seed. It says this, we're going to read verse 4 to 8, and then 11 to 15. Verse 4 to 8 says this, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering, everyone say scattering, the seed, some fell along the path, everyone say path, and it was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, say rocky ground. Some fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, say thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But here's verse 8. Still other seed fell on good soil. Say good soil. And that's what we all want to be. It came up, and listen to this. This is maturity. A mature heart is a heart that is open, that is soft. And when the seed of God's word is sown, this is what happens. It produces a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And in scripture, seed is a metaphor for lots of things. It's a metaphor for money. In this parable, and I'll go to Jesus as he explains this parable in a moment, he uses seed as the word of God, but the seed is used many times in scripture for different parables. But here it's relating to the word of God. And if you remember, several weeks ago, we had a word in the church here, or a word of knowledge, and Dan Reynolds picked up on it a couple of times, and it, it went along these lines. It was actually a word of knowledge for some people. And it said, God has spoken to you several times about something, and he's not going to speak to you again about the same thing. How many of you remember that? Two of you? That's great. Well, it did happen. You can go back and watch a video from a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, that does not mean that God stops speaking to you, because we're in a relationship constantly, a, a communication 
we are in him, he's in us, that doesn't break. But there does come a time, and this is what maturity is about, when God has to keep saying the same thing over and over and over again to a church, to an individual, to a family, to, the biz to a business, that's not maturity. And then sometimes I do believe God will play hide and seek with us where he'll stop speaking about that subject. He doesn't stop intimacy with you. And he plays hide and seek like we used to when we had kids where you hide behind the curtain, but you stick your feet out underneath and you cough, you know, so the young child can find you because he wants you to reach in. You don't need any more word. The seed is the word and God has sown seed. By way of example this morning, let me just take a few moments to do this. Dan and Fee aren't here, so I can't get into trouble this morning. I might pay the price for this later in the week. And if there's any issues, I will come and vacuum up the seed myself. But here's, here's you all, you represent different types of soil. All of you. Here's the seed, and this seed is good seed. If this seed falls on good soil, guess what? It will spring up and it will produce a hundredfold return or 30, 60 to 100 fold. So seed, and this is what the dynamic of a farmer. It's like as if in this parable, the farmer doesn't pay much attention to where he's sowing the seed, because you think a wise farmer would sow seed in good soil. But he just scatters seed. And that's what God is like us, is with us, and that's what he's like with his word. He just scatters seed. So he'll take seed and he'll just throw it. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. God never throws his word. But what I mean is, in a room like this, God will say the same thing to a host of people. The seed is exactly the same. Let's see how far back I can get. I'm coming to the back row, don't worry. Seed. Seed. I'll do it backwards. Seed. This is a nightmare for the camera guy. Seed. It's all the same seed. Even the back row people get it. Seed. Seed. More seed. I got two handfuls left. Seed. And just cause love, yeah, God loves this guy so much. Seed. Good seed is sown. And in this exa example and this parable, Ju Jesus uses seed concerning the word of God. There is nothing wrong with the word of God. Now, get back into this chapter with me. And then Jesus, he talks for a little bit between verse 8 and verse 11. But then in verse 11, he explains what he's just said. And it says this. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Nothing wrong with the seed. Those along the path are the ones that hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. That means every week when you're in church, every time you're in a secret time with God, every time you're listening to something, every time you do in your life, the last 46 weeks of this year, good seed has been sown. Now, nothing wrong with the seed. But have you been one that has let it, let the devil take it from you so that you may not believe and be saved? Those on the rocky ground are those that receive the word or the seed with joy when they hear it, but it has no root. So it's easy to get whooped up and excited on a Sunday morning, especially as we finish the worship and everyone's marching. It was like being back in the Dales Bible Weeks in 1985. We haven't got to march on for a long time, but everyone's getting excited. But that can wear off by Monday morning. They believe for a while, and in time, the te by testing, they fall away. Again, there's nothing wrong with the seed. It's, it's the soil. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear but go on their way, and they are choked by this life's worries. 
That's where a lot of people are at. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and continually hearing. And fear comes by listening to the voice of the enemy, people who aren't filled with the spirit of God, what is not a Christian or a kingdom worldview. And you can find very clearly what's in someone by how they speak. Out of the overflow of the heart, and again, soil here is referring to the heart of a person. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You sit with someone for an hour and you can tell what they've been feeding on, what they've been listening to, what they've been confessing, and what they've been reading. Does the word come out or do the worries of this life and the conspiracy theories that you have to spend an hour on every day to make sure you're not missing anything that China is doing or Trump is up to or someone else is up to? More time, where you put your time is what comes out into your heart and what comes out of your mouth. Anyway, I'm not dwelling on that this morning. I'm just mentioning it. And if you've been in that position, you can change the state of your heart this morning. Um, they get... Choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And it says this, and they do not mature. Telios, maturity. You can't afford to have your heart be like the ones we've just mentioned, where the seed, which is pure and beautiful, and can spring up to bring, to bring a maximum harvest, it's nothing to do with the seed. It's to do with the state of your heart and how you receive the word. We've also heard this a lot recently. A wise man builds his house on the rock. The blessing comes not in hearing the word, but in doing the word. And then it finishes this way. But the seed, and this is all of us, on good soil stands for those who with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by perseverance, they produce a crop. And that's the type of people that we want to be. We want to be people that have the word in us so that the word matures us. And again, as this, uh, this year is coming to an end, I just want to say, if God had highlights this year of things he spoke to you about and you received the word, listen, the word is as powerful today as it was spoken 51 weeks ago. The, the, the word of God is alive and active you can take seed that's been put in a cupboard for six years, plant it, water it, put it in the right condition and in the right soil, and it'll still produce. And so this is one of those words. It's not to say, look, if you've blown it, you've blown it. No. God's word is God's word. And God had an intention for this house. He had an intention for every family, every individual that's part that calls this church their family that he wanted you to mature in this year. And you can take stock this morning, and I'm going to teach you some practical ways of how to do it. But anything that God has spoken, that maybe you've left go because the soil of your heart wasn't very good, you can still get that seed back because you can change the condition of your heart. Let me just tell you this. A heart journey is a life journey. I've just had six months where I've had God rake my soul like never before. It's like he goes through with his plow and he, he pulls up all the stones, the big stones that are there, and the weeds, and he goes through and he purifies your heart. And by the way, if you're a believing Christian and a growing Christian and a mature Christian, this happens consistently because what was acceptable for you this year will not be acceptable for you next year because you're growing and maturing or maturing, whichever one you prefer. And we had that in the prophetic word that came from Evelyn this morning. So our heart is always changing. And then it's like you, just when God goes through it and it's ready for sowing, and he says, hang on, I want to go back through it. And just when you think there's nothing else in there that can come out, he uh, turns the soil again and then some lesser sized rocks come out. And then he goes through it again and some lesser sized rocks and some hidden weeds come out. And that's the, that's the process of sanctification. That's going to be happening for the rest of our life. So I'm not talking about being perfect. You're already the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's your heavenly position. But I'm talking about, um, I don't know, I, I, some Christians think they can play games. And it's like, well, God's word it was spoken. You know, I'll get around to it when I want to. That's not maturity. That's infancy. That's like still living on milk, as Paul says, when you should be feasting on steak. And so God is after a heart. There's nothing wrong with the seed. God is after a heart that is soft, that is open, 
that is going to receive the word, and this is maturity, retain the word, work with the word, speak the word, memorize the word, put the word before them, and see the word come to pass, mixing by faith what God has said. Here's another an analogy of seed. Do you know Jesus said, this is in Matthew chapter 17, he said, for I tell you the truth, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, and mustard seeds are one of the smallest seeds you can get, even if your seed is small like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, <clears throat> excuse me, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. This has nothing to do with Jesus moving the mountain. First of all, the seed of his word comes into your heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth is supposed to speak. And in faith and in the authority and the power that you've already got in Christ Jesus, you can release the word. This isn't the power of positive confession, although positive confession is still better than negative confession. You paint on the canvas of your heart and you create your world, your world, with your own words. But this is saying the seed that comes into your heart, if that's there, even if it's as small as a mustard seed, that's all the faith you've got, you can release it and you can move mountains and nothing will be impossible for you. So the state of our heart is very, very important. And I want to talk about that for the rest of this morning. So if you jump with me to my second text, come with me to Genesis chapter 30. And this is an unusual story, but I think it's got some power in the principles and power in the imagery of what is what we're going to see here. Genesis chapter 30, I'm going to read from 31 to 36, then I'm going to read from 37 to 43 just for the sake of time um, this morning. And we're going to talk about how to keep the word before you and in your heart, in your mouth. You're supposed to talk about it along the way, talk about it when you're at home, talk about it with your kids. The word is to always be before you and to be in you so that it can come out of you. Anyway, Genesis chapter 30, verse 31 says this. This is the story of Jacob who's been ripped off by his father-in-law. Um, we haven't got time to get into the background. I'm sure you know it. If not, read it later. But it says this. His father-in-law says, what shall I give you? He asked. Don't give me anything, Jacob replied. But if you will do this one thing for me, I will go on tending your flocks and watching over them. Listen to this. Please tune in on this. If you miss anything else this morning, don't miss this. Let me go through all your flocks today and remove from them every speckled, say speckled, and spotted, say spotted. Let me remove every speckled and spotted sheep and every dark colored lamb and every spotted, say spotted, or speckled, say speckled, goat. No, don't say goat, just say... Just say the S words. <laughs> and they will be my wages. And my honesty will testify before me in the future. Whenever you check on my wages that you have paid me, a goat in my possession that is not speckled, speckled. or spotted, spotted, and any lamb that is not dark colored will be considered stolen. Oh, you'd have to say stolen. Stolen, just because it begins with S. It's not part of my notes. Please pay attention to my notes. <clears throat> Jump down to verse 37. You, you can read the rest of it later. It says this. Jacob, however, now this is what he does. Now this is bizarre. He could have been paid. He could have asked for a lot of money because he's been ripped off by his father-in-law and cheated. He could have asked for anything. But this is what he asks for. Give me the spotted, speckled, and in a minute, we'll get the word streaked. Three S's. Spotted, speckled, streaked. Try saying that fast. Spotted, speckled, streaked. Jacob, however, listen to this. Please listen to this. Took fresh cut branches from popular almond and plane trees and made white stripes on them 
by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. What a bizarre thing to do. Follow with me a moment. That, by the way, this guy had promise and prophetic word over him from his father. So he had massive promise about what God was going to do in his life. But he, he does this practical action in verse 38. Then he placed the peeled branches in the water in troughs so that they would be directly in front. Say directly in front. Directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. In other words, these sheep and these goats, they would see these striped branches that had been peeled every time they came to water. They had to look at something. There was something set before their eyes. When the flocks were in heat and came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. So happy sheep time was done watching branches. And they brought young, and they were streaked and speckled or spotted. Then Jacob set apart the young of the flock for, for, by themselves and made the rest face the streaked and dark-colored animals that belonged to Laman. This he made separate flocks for himself and did not put with them into Laman's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so they would mate near the branches, but the animals that were weak, he would not place them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones to Jacob. In this way, say in this way. He set before them and then it says, in this way, what he did with these branches in front of the sheep and the goats, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. Now, you might think, what on earth is the point of that story? Well, I'll tell you. I didn't have time to climb a tree this morning and peel the bark off. Um, so this is my makeshift version. This is a broom handle that I put some black tape on. But you can see it's striped and it's speckled. Um, it's not spotted, but you get the idea. This is what he did. He took, a, he took a poplar tree and some other trees, stripped the bark so that it wasn't one color. It was many colors. How many of you know there's no power in a stripped tree? There's no power in this pole this morning. But he had the seed of God's word. He had destiny in his heart. And I believe God spoke to him a principle, which we can see elsewhere in Scripture, where he did this and he placed it before the people. Sorry, before the sheep and the goats and the lambs. And whenever they came to drink or whenever they came for happy time, that time of year when they were in heat, all they would do while they were mating and drinking is see streaked poplar trees. And there was something about what was set before them that when he did this, it reproduced what they were seeing. This is actually a miracle. What was put before their eyes at the watering trough, where they go every day, when they were in heat, when they were mating, he would put these sticks in front of them so that what they could see is what they'd become. How many of you know faith works like that? This is a basic definition of faith. What you hear is what you see, and what you see is what you'll go do. Faith comes by hearing, and then the word you've heard, to keep it before your eyes, you paint on the canvas of your heart, and inside yourself, you become more convinced about what God says about you than what the world says about you. You become absolutely, utterly convinced about the word. You look around you, and you think everything else is subject to change and temp temporal. It's going to move. My word, and God's word is eternal, and my eyes are fixed on God's word. So what you hear becomes what you see, and then what you see is what you go do. What you hear is what you see, and what you see is what you do. And where is the blessing on the word? Is it in the hearing? 
No, faith comes from hearing. The blessing is in the doing of the word. And I want to encourage you to get out anything that God has spoken to you this year, anything God has spoken to you this morning. Start looking at the soil of your heart and make sure it's soil that can produce seed, 30, 60, 100 fold what was sown. The seed is the seed. Get the seed out, get what God spoke to you about maturing out, and set it before your eyes. And you can do that in many, many ways. Just practically, you can write, in fact, I had a conversation this week uh, with someone, and they said, I've just gone old school. I said, what do you mean? They said, I started writing on sticky notes, scriptures, and sticking them all over the house, on the bathroom mirror, um, on the fridge, in my car, Everywhere, what, what God has spoken to me, I've written it down and I'm placing it before me so that I can see it consistently and it keeps my mind focused on what God has said, not on what seems to be going on in this temporal world. And you can keep the word before you in many ways. We're told to meditate on the word, chew the word over. You can put the word uh, whether it's a direct scripture or something that God has spoken to you, you can put it on your screensaver. At every single time you go on, um, you see it. There's a guy I met recently, um, a lovely fella. Um, he's got to walk with the Lord, but he's not. I wouldn't say he's an active church goer. Anyway, he's got a picture of Jesus as his screensaver. And if you met this guy, you wouldn't initially think he was a Christian. And he's a tough guy, businessman, you know, CEO level. And um, it's really funny, whenever he opens his phone up and sees this picture of Jesus, it reminds him to be a better person. And I've actually seen him bawl his eyes out just looking at this picture of Jesus because he wants to better himself. And in his, ho his own way, he's trying to keep before himself like a moral standard of, I want to see Jesus, so I want to keep it before my eyes. We haven't got time this morning to go all into the practical ways you can do it, but there's hundreds of ways you can keep the word and the promise and the dreams, and I want to say again, I've said this many times, dead dreams, old dreams can live again. Um, what I used to do, I'll tell you a story in a moment, and I'll finish with this illustration, is to do with the red spot that you've been watching all morning. I'll explain what that means in a moment. But um, there was a time I had a job um, 28 years ago, or more than that, 30-odd um, years ago. We church planted in Scotland. I'm from Wales, if you haven't guessed. Those of you that are spiritual here or listening on camera, you will understand my accent because you're used to listening to the voice of God. But a Welsh man and a Welsh woman went to Scotland for nine years where my two boys were born. And we were church planting and I, I had a job selling. And I got given the worst area to sell in in the whole country. And in my first year, I became the top salesman in the whole country and I turned that dead area, it was literally known as the graveyard, the area you cannot sell in. And I turned it into the most productive um, area in the whole country. And I was the top salesman in the whole of the UK and Ireland for many, many years. I'm not saying that to brag on myself. I'm saying that to say this. Do you know how it happened? First of all, I learned the art of selling. Secondly, I learned my product inside out. But this was the reason that I could sell, and I was selling fire extinguishers, I could sell five or six fire extinguishers a day where the previous guy couldn't even sell one a day. And it's because of this. God spoke to me from Isaiah and from the Psalms, and funnily enough, it was all Old Testament. And he gave me about six or seven scriptures to do with this job. It was a miracle I got it. I think I was 23 at the time, and you weren't supposed to be, get into this company until you were 25. God got me in, and then they found out after, but because I was selling so well, they wouldn't get rid of me. And anyway, God got me in this job, and God spoke these words to me. Now, some of you know me. Some of you have sat next to me in the meeting, and you know I cannot sing, correct? Yeah. I, that's not negative. It's just a fact. I wish I could sing. God help you if I could sing. I'd, be, I'd get the mic and sing. Prophetic songs all the time. I wish I was like Pat, the male version of Pat, but I'm not. I used to think I was tone deaf, and then I went for two um, singing lessons with an opera singer, and she's listening to me singing. Uh, she says, this is how to redeem every situation. 
I think I'm tone deaf. She says, you're not tone deaf. This is actually quite genius. She said, you just sing a quarter tone under everybody else, which means it sounds disgusting. <laughs> but she said, but every cloud has a silver lining. She said, you sing like Chinese people. So what I heard was, hey, let's go to China. Let's do the Bethel music thing in China and make some money. Um, I cannot sing. That's my point. Sorry for going off. Uh, and I don't care. You know, it's not a big deal. I believe in make a joyful noise. Anyway, um, what I did was these five or six words from Scripture, which God gave to me. I've got no more seed. The seed was good. I just wanted to make sure it stayed in my heart. I wanted to make sure it stayed before me every day. Because those of you that are in sales or know people that are in sales, once you've sold, you've got to go and sell again. And at the end of the day, you have to get up and do it all again. And at the end of the month, you've got to get up and do it all again. So I put these words together in a song, which was like a rap. Yeah, white man can rap. <laughs> Nobody except my wife has ever heard it. And don't panic. I'm not doing it for you this morning. But yeah, that's a sigh of relief. But what I did was I put all these words together in a rhyme. In Wales, we would call it a ditty. And I put them in this kind of rap. Let's be like Josh Luke Smith, sp spoken word, A. Um, <laughs> before spoken word was a thing. And every morning when I get up, I get in my, my car, I'd sing this song all day long. First call I'd go to, I'd be singing this song. In my head, if I was in front of someone, because it's weird just singing when you're trying to make a, a sale. Um, but I'd sing it before I go in the property. I'd sing it in the car. And what was I doing? I was just putting before my eyes and before my mind, not, you know, the cold Tuesday. It's snowing. I really want to go home early. Um, I put before my eyes the word, and I'd sing it. I'd sing it. I'd sing it. And that's why I turned a bad area where you couldn't sell one fire extinguisher a day, where I was selling five and a half. I know you can't sell half a fire extinguisher, but when it ratioed out, five and a half um, fire extinguishers a day. And I was the top salesperson, as I've said, in the whole of the country. Why? Listen, I'm not that good a salesperson. I worked hard and I put the hours in. But it's because every day, out of my mouth would come the word of God, and when I'm speaking it, I'm hearing it again, and faith comes by hearing. So no matter how many people said no, I knew the next person had to say yes because I had the promise of the word of God in front of me, and I'd sing it so I could listen to it. I'd sing it into the atmosphere. I'd do the mustard seed thing. He who has faith as small as a mustard seed shall say to this mountain, move from here to here, and nothing will be impossible for you. I'd walk into clients that I hadn't bought for 20 years, and out loud I'd say, you're buying a lot today from me. And it worked every single time. You know, there's a saying in the world, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. I don't know where that came from, and I don't know who the fat lady was, but I feel sorry for her. I heard a preacher once preach this sermon uh, based on a psalm, uh, sorry, on a chapter in Isaiah about the barren woman. Do you know what God says to barren people? You who, have bar you who are barren, sing. You who have, have no children, burst into songs of joy. And so there's a new saying, leave the fat lady alone, bless her. <laughs> it ain't over till the barren lady sings. It ain't over till the barren person sings. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter what conspiracy theories are dripping. It doesn't matter what the politicians are doing. It ain't over till this fat guy here sings and something is going to happen because the word can produce 30, 60, 100 times exactly what it was sown to do. And even if I get a mustard seed size of it out, I can move mountains. I can change people and I can bore you to death with the miraculous stories that happened. And as I said, I give all glory to God. I was good, but I wasn't that good. And anyway, in that job, and I'll close with this, genuinely, I'm one of those preachers that says when he's going to close, he does close. I'm going to close with this illustration. Um, I did very well in that company and it wasn't long because I was selling so well. 
that I got promoted and I was a sales trainer and I trained new salespeople. Then I was a sales manager. And the whole idea of this red spot that you've got today, and in fact, the idea of throwing seed out this morning um, was not for effect. I'd like every single one of you to pick up a piece of seed, put it in your pocket, and let it serve as something that's before your eyes this week, and carry a seed around in your pocket for as long as you can. And every day when you go in your pocket for your chewing gum or your car keys, you're going to feel the seed, and the seed will remind you of what we've spoken about this morning, remind you about the parable that we've looked at, remind you about the power of the word, and it's something that you set before you. It's not a trick. It's not a gimmick. It just keeps before your eyes and in your memory and in your remembrance what God has said to you. So take a seed with you, put it in your pocket or put it in your Bible, and remember the power of the word. But anyway, this story. One of the things, one of my jobs was to get salespeople to sell more fire extinguishers. That's what I was paid to do. And I'd have a sales team that I'd be in charge of, and you had to sell three fire extinguishers a day. And if you sold three fire extinguishers a day, your job's good. And by the way, these were like the Rolls Royce of fire extinguishers. The one you've got on the back wall there probably cost $50 now. When we were selling them 30 years ago, that size model that I was selling started at 300 pounds. Um, they were, you know, almost 10 times the price of all the others. That's why you only had to sell three. Uh, but if you sold three, your numbers were good. You'd have a very good living. And everything in sales, as you know, is about numbers. And so I'd, I'd have to get these guys that were going home early, that were selling one and a half, two, two and a half fire extinguishers a day. I had to get them up to three. And my general manager, who was in charge of the whole of Europe, this guy was a genius um, when he came to sales. And he came up with a principle that he called the red dot. That's why there's been a red dot up all morning. Little known to him, this, this has come from scripture, but he didn't know that. He wasn't, as far as I was aware, God-fearing man. And he came up with this idea of the red dot. Let me explain what it is. If you just, on a Friday afternoon, take sales calls from your salespeople to get their numbers for the week, telling them, you know, you sold two a day, that's not good enough, you need to do better. How many of you know that's not good management? And what's even worse, and I never did this, if you don't get your numbers up, you're going to lose your job. How many of you know that's terrible management? Never, ever do that. So my general manager came up with this principle, and I adopted it, and it was miraculous. Um, it's the red dot. <clears throat> and this is what we used to do. We were all sent um, a pack of stickers with a little red sticker that you could put in your rear view driving mirror. So every time you look to see what's behind you, in the corner you see this little red spot. And then we were sent slightly bigger ones, probably twice the size of a quarter, that you would put on the front of this salesperson's sales manual. So when he's selling, he sees the red spot. And when he's driving and looking in his rear view mirror at two o'clock in the afternoon thinking I'm gonna go home early, he sees the red spot. And the red spot represented something just like this illustration that I've used. And so if you were a good manager and you got, wanted to get your people to sell, this is what you would do. And I'm going to use local terminology. Obviously, I was in Scotland. None of it will make sense. So I'll, I'll shift the illustration to make sense to you. To get the person to sell more, you'd have to tap into a felt need in them that they would find motivation for to be able to sell more, which meant the numbers are up, the job is security, uh, sorry, secure, and the family are happy, and, you know, they're doing good, and they're hitting numbers. So what you would do, and what we were trained to do, is find out what in their life mattered to them. What would cause them to not go home at 2 o'clock if they hadn't sold three fire extinguishers? And you'd find where they felt need was. So I used to do things like this. I'd have a sales guy in the car, and I'd say, and again, I'm going to use local examples here, where are you going on holidays this year? And you say, oh, we're going to the Dells. I say, okay. I say, where are you staying? Oh, we're gonna, all, all four of us are going to cram into one little motel and we're going to rough it, but we're going to have a great time in the Dells. 
Um, you know, and we have to watch our money. We can't go in all the water parks because it's so expensive, but I found some cheap ones. I've got some tokens. I've got some discounts. I've got, um, you know, enough. I, I, I can do this. And so then I'd figure out, and it could be the person wanted a new car. It could be anything. It's just the holiday one worked because you, you could get the wife on board. Let me explain what you would do. You'd say to the guy, and again, you'd use words to paint on the canvas of his heart. You'd say, wouldn't you rather take your wife to Disneyland? Where you haven't got to cram into a you know, two-bedroom, get your whole family in one room, and have awful coffee. And it's not a continental breakfast. It's a stale donut in the morning. Wouldn't you rather have a suite overlooking the park with Egyptian cotton sheets and every day the maid comes in and she makes up towels into figures that look like the Disney characters and you get a little mint on your pillow and you get free passes to go to the front of the line. Um, so you'd have to do some research to find out how much it would cost and you can go to the front of the line and you don't have to stand in the queues like all the stupid Brits. You can just go straight to the front of the line and the Germans, and um, you can go straight to the front of the line, and you can, you, John, you could give your family a holiday of a lifetime. And in fact, it doesn't need to be this year. You could afford to do something like that every year. And you'd look as if, like you, as if you were stupid, but you caught his attention. And, I, and you'd say, this is doable for you. How much is your holiday gonna cost you that you've planned? $2,000. Okay, I've done some research to do what I just said. The package for your whole family is going to cost 10 grand. <gasps> I can't afford 10 grand. I said, let me tell you how you can do it. You're currently selling 2.3 fire extinguishers a day. If you got that up to three fire extinguishers a day, that would mean in one year you would earn an extra eight grand and you'd be able to have the pride and the dignity that you have taken your family on a holiday of a lifetime, which again, does not just need to be for this year. All you need to do is sell an extra 0.75 fire extinguishers a day. And we both know that you go home at one o'clock and you would tie this to the red spot. Now, if you're smart, you'd get the wife involved. You'd go and meet him at home because you had to go out with your salespeople um, once a month. So you go to the home, take with you a brochure from Disney World, sit down with, with, with his wife present and say, look at this, um, I'm John's manager and we are working on you guys going to Disneyland. And you can see this woman's eyes light up. And she said, we can't afford it. I said, I've already talked to John. All he needs to do is not come home at one o'clock in the afternoon, but just sell an extra three quarters of a fire extinguisher a day. And you can go here without it costing you any more than him coming home early, selling two and a half or two and a quarter fire extinguishers a day. It's doable. And then if you were really smart, what you would do is you'd send a photo every month of the resort. Now here, here's what you've done. You've tied something of value to the person, to the goal. And then everything would get locked into the red spot. And it was called the red spot theory. And so our culture and our language became, what's your red spot? And as I said, for some people it was a car, for some people it was whatever, it, you know, there's 101 things people wanted. But the way to motivate the cell was to give them something that they wanted that they think they couldn't have. And instead of going home, this is what used to happen, um, when they go into their sales presentation to talk to the guy and make the clothes, they'd look at their red spot. And all the red spot yelled at them in their face was Disneyland. So instead of going for the cheaper extinguishers, they try and sell higher value extinguishers. Then when they get in their van at the end of the day or the car to go home, You'd turn the key, look in the rear view mirror, and guess what they'd see? A little red spot. And the little red spot meant Disneyland. And all I have to do is sell three fire extinguishers a day. I've sold two, it's one o'clock, I wanna go home, but that 
would anchor you, what you set before you is what you do, that would anchor them into, oh, I can work for another hour or two and get another fire extinguisher. I'm going to give my family the holiday of the lifetime. And the thing about getting the wife involved, this was brilliant, was if he came home at two o'clock, <laughs> you got your wife doing you a job for you. First thing when he come in, uh, she said, how many fire extinguishers have you sold today? <laughs> and if he said two, she'd say, get back out because we are going to Disney World. You've got three more hours. Do not come home until you've sold three fire extinguishers. The kids know. Your manager sends us photos every month. You <laughs> Get back out. <laughs> now, you may think that's manipulation, and if you do, do. But to me, it's motivating someone it pleases the company, it saves their job, but it motivates someone to have value attached to what they need to do, but to get them to do it, there has to be a felt need and a value attached. So tie in the red spot theory, which again, to me was, again, the reason principles like that work often in sales and management and corporate world is because they've been stolen somehow in some way from the book of Proverbs or somewhere else in the Bible. And as I said, what I said this morning using the illustration that I did with the stick, you can find that truth all over Scripture. Jesus said, be careful what you say. And he also said, be careful what you pay attention to and what you look at. Um, we're supposed to set our eyes on heavenly things, not on earthly things. And so I want to encourage you with these practical things today. And again, it's not about, gimmick, it's not about gimmicks at all. But it's in your world, find things, whether it's a seed that you're going to take with you, a seed you keep in your Bible, go and buy a red spot and stick it somewhere. Pray, believe, what has God said to you? What did God say to you in January that you still haven't maximized? What is God saying to you today that your heart needs to be good soil to receive? And do something. S sing. It's not over till the barren lady sings. Quote scripture, get the word in front of you, get the word before you. Let your red dot be the promises of God and the vision that you have that if you f God does what he said he would do, and he will because there's nothing wrong with the seed, and you just cooperate and believe it and see it and do it, it'll manifest. And as we heard again in a prophetic word this morning, all of a sudden the suddenly of God happens and you're living in metaphorically the promised land of what the promise represented or you live in immaturity and as a church you gain in the ground that God has spoken to you about you don't need another prophecy you don't need another ditty you don't need another song you don't need another banner you just simply need to write what has God said let's do that let's keep that before us and let's do it and we will get a harvest 30 60 or 100 times what was sown so that's my encouragement to you this morning and the practical tools i think things are much easier when they're practical and again if you're offended with any of them it, it's just an illustration all illustrations fall down somewhere find in your own life what it means to you to keep the promises of god uh, before you no musician came up so that if that's the sign that i can keep preaching Teresa, you should have been up here do you want to come up so I, i'll stop yes I am done preaching, I kept to my time, but I do have a couple of um, w words of knowledge that I've been carrying for a few weeks that I'm going to give and then we'll release you, um, or someone will release you, that's Johnny's job. Um, so just play, can you play, let me see, can you play a light breeze? Mm -hmm. I know you can. Thank you. I'm just going to close. This is our close this morning. First of all, before I give these two words, can everybody close your eyes a moment? If there's someone here this morning or someone on TV watching um, or via the internet, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've never asked him into your life, now is the moment. Just say this prayer after me. And if you're on your own somewhere, say it out loud. If you're in this room, say it out loud. Can I ask the rest of the church in this room to say it out loud as well? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, thank you you died on a cross for me. You paid the price for my sin. And I am a sinner. 
and I'm far away from you. Today, I repent of my sin. I put my faith in you as Lord and Savior. And from this moment on, I give you the driving wheel and the driving seat and the reins of my life. From now on, I'm going to live for you. If you prayed that prayer online, if you prayed that prayer in this room, something miraculous happened. You just got born from above. Your spirits come alive to God. Can we give everyone a cheer that may have prayed that? And I want to do this. I'm not going to ask you to come out the front, but if you prayed that prayer this morning and someone brought you here, please tell them that you prayed the prayer and then come down the front at the end and some of the leaders, any, anybody that looks cool and mature on the front row, they are leaders. Um, if you prayed that prayer and you're in this room, just come to the front and talk to them. If someone brought you, tell them and have them come with you. And we'll just help you with some early steps. If you're online and you prayed this prayer, send an email to the office and we'll get you connected in a similar way. Um, that's the most important miracle that could happen today. But I got, I've had three visions, uh, sorry, two visions that I've been carrying for about three weeks. And I just want to release them this morning. I saw one vision, and some of you will relate to this because this happens in dreams sometimes. I saw some people running, trying to get away from something. And the feeling and the vision that I had, it's like the person was running in sand, but just inside the water. You know when you go to a beach? or you go to a lakefront um, when the waves are lapping. It's one thing to run on sand. It's very difficult to run in water on sand. And in this vision, I saw several people, and this is applicable for people in the room, because I've been carrying it for this, this house in particular, and also if you're online, that you've been trying and trying and trying to get ground and move forward and get away from something. And it's like as if you're running in water and you just can't get up physically the speed that you want to move at in your heart. And I just believe God is going to release you today. And all of a sudden the vision shifts and you're not any longer running in sea and sand, but you're running on a nice green astroturf where you can run to the degree that you want to run. Hold that a moment because God is going to make a suddenly shift in your life when we pray.